patient to give a talk. Uh, and uh, uh, I um, uh, am very happy to, um, uh, to, to give a talk in this uh, seminar. Uh, firstly, I'd like to mention that I'm far from being a, a specialist of ISS um, uh, for uh, uh, finite or infinite dimensional systems. So I just uh, began working on that uh, while uh, I had the visit of uh, Rene Hosfeld, and then we did a first. Uh, a first work on on this subject with the uh, Birgit Jakob and with uh, and with Felix, uh, and uh, uh, so with this um, um, opportunity, uh, we realized that um, uh, there aren't many uh, uh, results of this type uh, for systems describing uh, uh, problems in fluid dynamics. Uh, so we tried to do a first. Uh, uh, let's say, um, step uh, into this uh, direction, which I will very briefly mention in this talk, but I uh, will uh, mainly focus on uh, situations which are quite uh, unusual uh, for uh, a community which is uh, not accustomed with, uh, with uh, fluid dynamics, and uh, they are un unusual, especially be uh, because of the type of stability of the considered systems, which is... Uh, uh, which is uh, quite um, weak uh, with respect uh, to the stability properties uh, which we are accustomed with uh, uh, in, uh, in control theory. Uh, so let me uh, go to uh, the outline of uh, my talk. Uh, I will begin with some uh, introductory examples. Uh, and then I will uh, immediately uh, uh, discuss um, a situation which is um, uh, very rarely, um, let's say, uh, studied uh, in uh, system theorems uh, is uh, the situation in which the considered PDEs hold in unbounded uh, domains. Uh, typically, uh, you have a, an obstacle which is fixed or which it is moving in a fluid, and the fluid is so large that you can reasonably assume that it fills the remaining part of the space. Uh, so this is a situation which is um, uh, quite studied in uh, mathematical fluid dynamics and which uh, is um, not very comfortable, as I will try to um, convince you from the uh, controller theoretic viewpoint. However, it turns out uh, that um, uh, ISS type properties uh, could be... Um, uh, can be uh, established, uh, however, with uh, some uh, modifications uh, which uh, are not really uh, avoidable. So I will also try to, to pass the message that maybe uh, some uh, definition should be a bit uh, generalized to include this kind of situations. Uh, and then I will focus on uh, the situation where the fluid is um, uh, surrounds a solid which is freely moving in this fluid. Uh, which means that we have a, a problem where the spatial domain where the PD holds uh, changes with respect to, to time. Uh, so in this situation, I will not, uh, I will just mention a very simple ISS type result, but I will essentially explain how can we hope at least to prove that globals in time solutions exists, and then uh, which would be uh, uh, the natural framework to establish ISS uh, estimates. So uh, let me go to these uh, introductory uh, examples. Uh, first, the general context, as I mentioned. Uh, so we have a fluid which fills the blue domain omega. Uh, this uh, here is just a, re a rectangular container, let's say, but it can be the whole space. So you can imagine that this extends to the whole uh, arc two. Uh, we will discuss both situations. The situation where it's uh, bounded, the container, it's more comfortable uh, from the ISS viewpoint at least. Then uh, in this uh, fluid, there is an obstacle denoted by O and which is uh, in red, which is either fixed uh, or uh, it's really uh, uh, moving uh, 
due to the flow of the fluid. In this case, of course, the domain omega will not be fixed in time, will depend on time, will be the complementary of uh, the red uh, region, uh, which is, which in the second situation will not uh, be fixed. Uh, then we can act with an input. Here, I, it can be different type of inputs. Here, in general, in, this, uh, in the examples I will uh, consider, it will be an input uh, supported uh, in some bounded uh, set uh, U, which will be like a force type input. Uh, which acts on in the in the yellow zone, which will be most of the time supposed to be bounded, so a bounded uh, support. Uh, so uh, here I have been uh, working on these problems for a certain times. Uh, uh, in fact, it begin uh, in um, in the uh, beginning of the of this century. <laughs> uh, this type of problems, uh, and uh, I will I essentially focused on uh, existence and uniqueness. Um, Theorem in the case when the solid is moving on the in the free boundary case. Uh, and uh, more recently, I, I got interested to, uh, to, to control problems and also to, um, to ISA uh, type uh, estimates for, uh, for this kind uh, of systems. But uh, let us uh, first uh, take a very simple situation in which uh, I assume uh, that uh, in fact the solid O is fixed, so the the solid the domain omega is fixed, so it doesn't matter if it's exactly this topology if there is a hole or not in this case, but what matters here uh, is just that I have a, a capital omega which is fixed. Uh, so uh, the most uh, famous probably uh, system in fluid dynamics is uh, the incompressible Navier-Stokes system. And uh, if we write it uh, in, a, in this fixed domain omega, it will be the Navier-Stokes uh, equations. Uh, so it will be uh, the first uh, equation here, which is the expression of the uh, balance of linear momentum. Uh, Z will be the velocity field of the fluid uh, at instant T and at point X. Uh, so this, that's the famous Navier-Stokes equation where you have the incompressibility conditions, divergence of Z is equal to zero. And as a counterpound, uh, which appears, let's say, in a certain way as a Lagrange multiplier, we have the pressure term, uh, a gradient P, which appears in the Navier-Stokes um, uh, equation. So uh, I, I'm, I make the, the obvious remark that uh, uh, there is no derivative with respect to time of P, which appears in our equations. Uh, so, in fact, uh, P is not a part of the state uh, of the system. Okay? So, sometimes uh, uh, in uh, control theory, this kind of systems, this, this system can be described uh, as a descriptor system. Uh, and uh, then I, uh, I added an input U, which is a force, uh, which acts eventually in, a, in an open subset of omega, but it can act also in all of omega here because we have a bounded. Uh, uh, domain capital omega. Uh, as far as uh, as um, I know, there there is no there was no uh, um, let's say explicit ISS type estimate uh, for these systems. Uh, so uh, in the uh, our recent work with uh, Rene Hossel, Billy Tiapom, and Felix Schweninger, uh, we. Uh, did an abstract framework, which I will not describe here. Uh, we, uh, we, in fact, we adapted an abstract uh, framework I previously proposed with uh, George Weiss to include uh, problems of this type. So it's linear systems with bilinear feedback. So because I have this bilinear term here, uh, Z gradient Z. And uh, we have shown uh, that we have uh, a local ISS uh, type estimate, but L2 ohm with a weight omega type estimate. So more precisely, while local for small initial data in the norm H1, uh, H1 is the usual Sobolev space, plus uh, a small input functions in weighted L2 uh, of zero infinity L2, L2 space. So for small enough data, so 
initial data and input function. I have global in time solution. This is a, the critical point here in the system to establish that you have global in time solutions, which keep the regular, preserve the regularity of the initial data. And we satisfy this kind of ISS type estimate. So uh, uh, I, uh, I have here the input, which also it's measured in this uh, weighted spaces if I want to have some uh, decay in time uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, second term of uh, our, our estimate. So that's the estimate we have uh, proved. We have proved as a corollary of an abstract uh, frame. So here it is a situation uh, where uh, this smallness condition is clearly necessary. Maybe it's not sharp, but it's clearly necessary because we know that even for u is equal to zero, cannot, uh, we cannot say if there exist global in time solutions unless uh, the data are, are small. So this is, let's say, in, in somehow related to the uh, one of the millennium uh, problems. Uh, so that's what we said here without u. It's an obvious fact, obvious, well-known fact in the theory and other stocks. So our contribution is that we can put the U uh, in this uh, weighted uh, norm and we get an uh, ISFs uh, type estimate. Uh, so which are the main ingredients? So once again, uh, we have obtained it as a corollary of an abstract result, but nevertheless, what was, uh, what, what's hidden? Uh, in the use of these abstract results. First, very importantly, the exponential stability of the linearized system. So, I mean, linearized around the, uh, the origin. Uh, in other words, if I just uh, neglect this nonlinear term here, I get the Stokes system in a bounded image, it's called the so Stokes evolution system, which is not difficult to show that it's exponentially stable uh, it's an exponentially stable system, uh, provided that omega is bounded. bounded. Why? Because we need the, uh, we need the, the, um, uh, the Poincaré inequality to establish this um, exponential decay. And in fact, we'll come back to this later. It's not true in general in unbounded domains. So first, there is a property of the linearization, which is here, it's strong. And it's a property which we have in many other examples which have been studied in the literature, which is exponential stability. Uh, then we have some control on the nonlinear term. That's very important. Uh, so here, uh, if you see, uh, it's um, uh, in fact uh, uh, something which is um, Almost obvious if here, instead of the norm H1, I will put the norm H2 in the middle factor. Uh, there is just uh, an, obvious, uh, 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 an obvious consequence of the, uh, the so uh, so bolev bearing This uh, uh, inequality, which I wrote here, is slightly more complicated to get. So the, the, let's say the, the gain and the thing which makes it work is that here I can put uh, with a power smaller than one, the H1 norm uh, instead of the H2 one. So you remark that here the uh, over five plus uh, eight over five makes two. So all this is a fourth degree term as in the left-hand side. So I need the, I need the homogeneity, of course, to have such inequalities um, uh, to make sense. Uh, so these are the two ingredients and these allow uh, in fact, uh, to, uh, to get a proof, uh, uh, which is maybe a bit unusual uh, in ISS type problems, which is a fixed point directly uh, in uh, this weighted uh, space. Uh, so in other words, what we do is that instead of this F, we insert a function which has a certain good decrease at infinity, a given function, F, let's say, which has a good uh, decay at infinity, uh, then using the exponential stability of the semi-group, we get estimates for the solution Z. And so to the F, which I put here instead of the, the nonlinear term, I will associate the nonlinearity and I obtain with some work that we have uh, a fixed point. So uh, it's a bit different of the 
usual way uh, we are uh, obtaining uh, ISF side properties uh, around uh, exponentially stable states, which uh, I, uh, I uh, try to uh, recall is in general uh, that we get a local result and then using uh, Lyapunov type functions, we show that the solution does not blow up in finite time and then eventually we obtain decay estimates. Here, uh, I, I, I don't claim that it doesn't work with the Lyapunov type approach. I think that in this case, in fact, it would work. Uh, but uh, here, uh, uh, we what we do is from the beginning, we do from the beginning an, uh, uh, a fixed point in a space of functions defined on zero infinity. So we get the global in time existence from the beginning. And then we remark that the decay estimate is more or less a, a simpler corollary, the decay estimate, I mean the ISS type estimate uh, in this case. Uh, so in fact, in this case, the ISS type estimate is included in the fixed point. <laughs> so we use the ISS type property for the linearized problem for which being a exponentially stable system, there is no problem to, to have it. So that's the way we, we tackle this, the philosophy uh, behind. So it's a very different um, way of presenting it as in our paper, where in fact, we did all this uh, cuisine. For instance, this inequality has been written as an abstract assumption on, on our systems, which then when we went to the Navier stocks, we, we said, okay, it's satisfied, but in fact, this was our motivating uh, example. Uh, so this was an example in free space dimension. That's important. Uh, things could be simpler in two space dimension. Uh, and uh, with a fixed uh, domain. To go to a moving domain, I take a problem which is um, an uh, from a certain viewpoint, much simpler, not to mix all the difficulties. So I go to a simplified fluid structure problem, uh, which had been first studied by Vasquez and Zoazua, which is like a toy problem. So here, instead of the Navier-Stokes problem, I have the viscous Burgers equation, which is written on this segment, zero one. So it's still nonlinear, but instead of navier stokes I have something which is much, much simpler. And then we have a structure. A structure is just a point here. So it separates our interval in two parts. Uh, so it's from zero to h of t here. The green point is h of t. And from h of t to one. And then I have the velocity is continuous. So h of t is the distance at this uh, green point to the origin. Its velocity will be h dot of t. Uh, and then I have uh, a force which acts on the solid, which is given by an input function u. Uh, this is an external force, but it's also the force which can exerted by the fluid, which is the jump of the uh, derivative of velocity. So it's a kind of stress. Uh, uh, the force uh, exerted by the uh, by the fluid on the solid. Uh, and uh, again, we uh, situate ourselves in a situation where uh, um, all the system is in a boundary domain. Here, the boundary domain will just, just be the interval minus one, one. Here, in fact, we do a control problem, but uh, we, I will not insist on that. So normally I'll see if it works. It doesn't work my, my small uh, simulation. And so, in fact, here the domain in which my PD holds, you see, is the two intervals minus one h of t and h of t to one, and it changes in time. And this change is one of the unknowns of the problem. How to tackle this kind of difficulties? I will explain a bit later in a more um, complicated context. But what I want to say that here for this problem, because it's one D. Uh, we are able to show a global ISS type uh, result. Uh, so uh, with the state space L2 for the velocity of the fluid, with the state space uh, C for the velocity of the solid, and we get uh, a very uh, uh, reasonable uh, estimate, which in fact formally can be obtained very easily 
uh, by taking this expression as a Lyapunov function. Just take the energy as a Lyapunov sphere function, everything will be uh, good, at least formally, uh, because uh, this uh, nonlinear term, with, when roughly speaking, you take here the inner product with V in L2, this product, this term will, will just disappear. And moreover, uh, this jump term also will, will cancel with the boundary terms which come uh, from the uh, viscosity term in the, in the Berger's equation. So in fact, everything cancels well. What's difficult here, because it's not trivial, even if it's in 1D, is to show that these estimates make sense. So first we have smoother solutions. And also what's very funny here, uh, and we can show it, it's to show that you'll never touch, uh, the solid will never touch the boundary. So H of T will never be one or minus one. So here it's a more uh, complicated mathematical analysis uh, uh, process. But nevertheless, this is a very simple example. So which we were the first to consider in the, in the bounded interval, what Zoazua uh, uh, and Vasquez did, I mentioned that they were the first to consider this kind of uh, toy problems was to take instead of minus one, one, the whole real line and to look what happens when the time is large. So in a certain way, they look to uh, uh, ISS or, or just to stability of this uh, nonlinear system. I will maybe uh, come back to that, but in a more general context. So here, I just try to stress that uh, at this level of regulatory separateness, you have to be very careful how to you define what a solution is, and that to show that they exist globally in time, it's a real challenge. I will uh, come back to this uh, problem later, and I will end up on this uh, with this example by saying that this is the only example where we are able to show global results in free structure problems. So here, there is no smallness condition. That's, uh, that's a remarkable feature of this 1D problem and which will not be able to reproduce uh, uh, in several space dimension, unfortunately. Uh, then in the same style, which would be the natural generalization of uh, this problem, is just to consider Navier stocks in this kind of croissant. You can assume that it's a 3D croissant. So you have Navier stocks in a domain F, uh, which depends on the position of the ball, so the ball initially is centered here. I have a rigid ball. Then I give an initial velocity to the solid and to the fluid. Here there is no input, at least in the paper I mentioned, we have no input. So one of the problem, interesting problem here would be to add one. So no, I, I, it's not correct. I have an input, sorry. I have an input for the moment, which acts only on the solid. So which are the equations here? I have Navier-Stokes equation, the first two equations which hold in the domain denoted by F and H of T. So what is this? Is the croissant uh, from which I'm uh, subtracting a ball centered of, at H of T, the current position of the, of the center of the ball. So this is uh, time variable and unknown. Then I had Dirichlet boundary conditions, homogeneous at the exterior of this croissant. So at the exterior boundary, then at the interface where the ball lies, here is the initial position, I have continuity of the velocity field. And then as I mentioned, all of this is coupled. The motion of the, of the ball is not a priori given. So uh, it's motion, it's uh, described by Newton's law. We say that the mass time acceleration is equal to the force exerted by the fluid it's this term, sigma here, stands for the stress tensor associated to the velocity v, field V and to the pressure field P. So this is the, the force exerted by the fluid on the, uh, on the solid. And I add an exterior force U, which will be, uh, can be, it can be seen as an input. And then since here we are in several space dimensions, we need also uh, the uh, balance of angular momentum, which says that the, the variation of angular momentum of the, of the ball here will be uh, the, uh, the momentum of the forces, the sum 
of the, the, the torque exerted by the fluid on the solid, which is this term. You know, again, here we see the, the stress tensor, but here it is multiplied by, uh, by uh, uh, the vector x minus h. So I have two these two equations coupled. So everything is coupled here. And then I should add the initial uh, data. So this is a, a system which um, uh, we have uh, uh, considered in a, in a work with um, uh, George Weiss and Takeo Takahashi. So it's quite old result. Uh, and here, in fact, we are interested in a stabilization problems. Uh, but uh, in fact, we wanted to stabilize to a given position. Here, I will simplify my, my statement. So I will assume just that omega is bounded. I will take an input u in L2. Uh, and then we are able to show, so here I don't have really estimates. Uh, it has to be uh, carefully written. For initial data, which are small uh, enough in an appropriate sense, I have global in time solutions. Global in time means that my ball will not touch the exterior boundary in particular. And that the L2 norm of the solution goes, of the velocity goes to zero. And the final, uh, uh, the position of the ball converges to some finite position, which I call H1. What's interesting here, so to go back to my picture, so I, I, uh, if, you, if there is no control uh, here, my, uh, the, the ball will converge to final positions, but which theoretically should be determined by the initial data. But at this stage, we have no clue of saying which will be the final position in terms of the initial one. Uh, so uh, although we are able to show that this final, let's say, asymptotically final position exists. Uh, so what we have done in this paper is to prove global in time existence with a method which I tried to explain a bit in a different and more complicated uh, context a bit uh, later, and we uh, took a control which would stabilize it to a final position which we prescribed. So we didn't leave this H1 to be arbitrary, but by changing a, a, a good feedback, which is very easy in fact, uh, we, have, um, uh, we have shown uh, that uh, we can stabilize uh, the position of the ball to any uh, to any um, let's say, admissible final position. So we conjecture that we should have an ISS type estimate. So we get estimates for the decay of velocity here, which should be exponential. Uh, and uh, here, essentially, we have some weighted exponential uh, decay, but uh, it has not been, uh, uh, let's say, uh, studied in detail. So it's up to now conjecture. I think it's not a very difficult, uh, uh, the very difficult one, but it's all what I can say at, at this stage. To uh, the unbounded domains uh, and to explain where the difficulty lies in this case and where, in fact, uh, maybe some definition should be adapted to, to, to cover this, uh, this type of situation. Uh, I'll take the first, uh, the most, one of the most basic examples, which is just a heat equation in R3. So I take a heat equation. I, uh, my input here will be a, a function u, which is localized in some uh, fixed uh, open subset, uh, capital O, or curly O. So here I don't have any obstacle. My equation is written in all R3 uh, and uh, for positive time. And I have just some initial states and, and the control. Then we know. Uh, that uh, the state trajectory is given by the variation of constants formula or by UML's formula uh, with T, the heat semigroup. The heat semigroup, which since we are in the whole space, uh, has an explicit uh, formula uh, written here, uh, where what we can see is this T power minus three half, uh, which, uh, which appears in a general setting. It's T power minus the dimension of the, the space here, three, divided by, by two. So uh, here, of course, when you look uh, uh, 
uh, what happens when, when t goes to infinity. When t goes to infinity, somehow we see that this term uh, will not no longer be um, very important. It depends, of course, on, on x also, but in general, we cannot really count on this, uh, the, the decay is this exponential when t is very large. So roughly speaking, we'll get only this one. Uh, so to be more in functional analytic uh, terms, our semigroup is not exponential, exponentially stable. It's growth bound, it will be one here as a semigroup in L2 of R3. Uh, it will be strong, however, strongly stable in this space. Uh, then one could think, what should some people already began to think of this kind of form, maybe uh, T has a weaker stability property, which is called the polynomial stable or quasi stable, which roughly speaking means that it uh, can be stable for, uh, for data in the domain of the operator, for initial data in the domain of the operator. So in you know, other words, maybe I will have decay, L2 decay, uh, for uh, data which are in the domain of the operator, which here will be the H2 space. The domain of the generator is the H2 sub L space. This is also not, not true. Uh, there is a result uh, very, very easy to prove. Uh, you can find it also in, an, in a paper of uh, Till and, Tom, Tom, uh, and Tomilov. Uh, uh, this uh, is not even a polynomially stable semigroup. So you don't even have decay estimates uh, for uh, data in the domain of uh, the operator. Uh, so what do you have? Do we have? In fact, here we have to play at the, at the same time with several LP spaces. Uh, so TTF will be in many LP spaces, will be uh, in uh, uh, many LP spaces if I take an initial data in L1 or L2. Uh, but uh, so for instance, if I want to estimate the norm in L2, I need, uh, I have a decay, uh, but which is uh, controlled. Uh, first, it's not exponential uh, and it's controlled by the norm of the function in L1. So here L1, L2 cannot be compared with, because we are in the whole, we, we are in the whole space. So I have also an um, L infinity estimate. In fact, uh, the L2 estimate here is obtained from the L infinity. The L infinity estimate is very easy to design to obtain from this uh, formula. The L1 estimate is also easy to obtain from this formula. And then one uses the restoring theorem to obtain the L2. So if you are interested in the decay of the semigroup in L2, there is something, but uh, it's uh, uh, obtained, uh, it's controlled by, by the L1 norm. Uh, now you can say, okay, uh, maybe, uh, I would, um, uh, it suffices to take F uh, in, um, how do you support it? Although I would look solution in the whole space, uh, then I, uh, I can take F boundary support, it. then the L1 uh, norm will be controlled by the L2 norm. And this is true, but then the constant depends on, on the support. So it's already for this problem. I don't know which it will be the, the, best, uh, the best type of ISS estimate. Uh, for instance, we can, we can say something like this inequality uh, at, uh, in the bottom, at the bottom of the slide. So which controls the L infinity norm in terms of the L1 norm of the initial state. And then assuming that both U and Z0 are compactly supported with respect to the space variable, we can eventually uh, switch here to L infinity norms everywhere or to L2 norms. Uh, that's a question which I, I, I'm i just uh, wondering which would be a, a good uh, type of estimate, but the, the one which naturally arises is uh, what, I'm writing, uh, what I'm writing here. So I'm, there is no way to obtain here L2 here and L2 here, then I will not, not get a, a function tending to zero uh, in the first, uh, in the first term. So here, all of this, what I'm saying, very easy to obtain because I use the, uh, the explicit formula of the semigroup. 
Now, a very nice uh, result, which um, uh, stability results here, I would, uh, uh, for the moment, speak about just stability. Uh, and then I will eventually try to come back to uh, ISS, but uh, just stability for a uh, linearized fluid dynamics equation. It's um, a work of Ivashita from 1989, which considered a fluid flow at the exterior of an obstacle. So I have this situation. I go back to my first slide. F forget one moment about the input. I just have an obstacle O and the fluid, the, the blue domain is the remaining part of R3, all but uh, capital O. Uh, so that's how I get uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, stops evolution equation at the exterior of the obstacle O in free space dimension. So dimension here is important. Uh, and uh, uh, here, of course, when you are at the exterior of a, of a domain, you don't, you are very far of having explicit formulas of the same. Uh, even if I replace Stokes system by a heat equation, but in the in this domain with a Dirichlet boundary condition, I don't have explicit formulas. Uh, however, for the heat equations, uh, it's a bit easier. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the ideas are the same. And uh, Iva Shita was, uh, has been studying this problem in the exterior domain from a point of view which uh, can be seen as a stability uh, viewpoint. And what uh, did he prove? Uh, uh, he proved that for every Q larger than one, if you don't measure the norm of the velocity field everywhere, but you just localize. So in control theoretic terms, this means that I take an output. I take an output, which is the restriction of my velocity field to a ball, to a ball, which of course contains the obstacle. Uh, then I get, I get a decay rate. Uh, so this estimate number one here will not hold if instead of omega r, I put omega. Uh, so I don't have decay in LQ because saying that you have decay to zero in LQ since it's it's a semi-group in LQ, uh, would mean that I have exponential decay, which is not true. Uh, but nevertheless, if I don't measure the velocity everywhere, I focus myself just on a, the restriction to some ball of radius R, then uh, I get, uh, uh, I get uh, a decay rate, which is uh, of this order minus uh, T power minus three half over two Q. Two Q. Uh, we have also a decay estimate if we, we don't want to have uh, an output, in other words, to restrict our velocity field to a ball, then I have a decay rate, but uh, uh, you will estimate the norm in LR uh, by this power minus sigma, which is a positive power, uh, times the V0 in LQ. So here, which is the most favorable situation, the most... Uh, so the most favorable situation would be with the largest possible sigma. I want the largest decay rate. So in this case, I, I should take Q essentially equal to one and R is equal to infinity. I cannot do it according to Ivashita results because my Q is larger than one, but it's arbitrarily larger and larger than one. So I can get very close of a decay rate, which is power T minus three half, provided that I will uh, uh, measure uh, my uh, uh, my solution in L infinity uh, and uh, or, or, or in an LR with very large R. And I will take my uh, initial data in an LQ uh, with Q as close as I wish to, to one. So again, here, the price to pay is that I have different norms. Uh, and uh, it's not just that uh, I am we cannot do better, uh, I, I, we are not able to do better, but it's not possible due to the fact that these semi-groups are not exponentially stable or not even polynomially stable, uh, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, so that's for the, here, Ivashita's result for 89 is with the obstacle O fixed. So my equation holds my PDE holds in the complementary and fixed obstacle, and I have homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition on the obstacle.
so uh of course with this uh, uh just keeping for the moment this framework i can translate this in a something which is not really an uh, iss type estimate which is given in this property it's more i would say an input to output stability estimate because what i will estimate here uh, is uh, the norm of uh, uh, the restriction of the velocity field to omega r where i repeat omega r is the intersection of omega with a ball of radius r so if i do this if Pay, if I pay this price, uh, what I get is an, a, a decay estimate. So an, a really ISS type estimate with T minus sigma here, with the sigma, which is, uh, as roughly speaking, the best I can hope is three half. Uh, and uh, with a, a good estimate for, uh, with respect to the, to the input function. So just using the property of a semi-group and uh, the variation of constants property, this is what I get. And I don't see how I can get how I could get much much better uh, in uh, in uh, this very simple fluid dynamics problem. So what does this Stokes problem model? Uh, directly speaking, is not easy to say, but roughly speaking, it's what's called low Reynolds number flow. So uh, flows where the velocity is small and where the uh, the objects inside are also not, not too large. The Reynolds number is, is small. Uh, so what we uh, wanted to do is to still to keep it linear for the moment. If we want to discuss some, um, uh, some ISS star property, I will go back then to nonlinear problems. So to keep it linear and to see what we can get, go for moving uh, bodies. But first, let me introduce the model. Uh, so the model, which I have recently studied with uh, uh, Sylvain Hervedoza and Debayan Maiti, is the following one. So you have already seen Navier-Stokes equations. And here, we didn't study um, ISS. But again, I think that ISS can be uh, obtained uh, once we have correctly uh, uh, correctly defined the function spaces, uh, and we have proved our global uh, in time existence theorem. So I have now this looks in a domain H of T. What is H of T? Uh, F, uh, so B of H of T is the ball of center F H of T and the radius one. F of H of T is the complementary with respect to R free. So I have a fixed, uh, a ball which moves, which have center H of T and uh, the remaining part of the three-dimensional space is what I call f of h of t, and that's where I consider the Navier-Stokes equation, the balance of linear momentum plus the incompressibility condition. Uh, then I, oh, so here the first equation, the third equation should be erased. I don't have it, so sorry for that. We are in an unbounded space. I don't have such a condition. This one is should not be here. Uh, the fourth one, it's. Uh, it's, it will be it will be there, and uh, it just says that I have continuity of the velocity field at the interface between the solid and the fluid, and then I will have uh, uh, the balance of linear and angular momentum for the body. So the same equations. The difference with respect to the situation in the paper with uh, Weiss and Takahashi uh, is that uh, I um, um, I consider the unbounded uh, case. So in fact, it's uh, this problem. Uh, if uh, in fact uh, it's in the R two instead of R three, has had already been studied by Hervedoza, Ilere, and Lakav, uh, and they have obtained global existence for small data. And what they have shown. So one one question which is interesting uh, uh, is to say what happens to the solid. More precisely, let me come one back one moment to my picture, my initial picture. I have my solid, I give, I give a kick to the solid and even an initial velocity, the fluid, and then I do nothing. Question, and, and this blue domain is infinite. It's the whole space, it's the whole space. Question, 
will the solid absor asymptotically stop or will it, will it go to infinity? Uh, so this is also the question which uh, Zoazua and Va Vasquez have been asking in 1D. And then the answer was first given by Zoazua and Vasquez in 1D, it's not quoted here. And roughly speaking, they said that it will not stop. In 1D for the toy problem, it will go escape to infinity. So you just give a small kick to the solid and then you do nothing. The solid will go to infinity, which looks a bit, uh, a bit strange with respect to our practical experience, at least as far as we can, can have a practical experience for these problems in an unbounded domain. In two space dimensions, Hervé-Dosa, Hilaire, and Lacave obtained this estimate, which we see h dot is the velocity. So h dot be behaves like one over square root of t when t is large, but it's just an upper bound, which is not far of being sharp, but they are not, not able to prove it's sharp. So somehow if I accept it's sharp, it will also not stop because h dot behaving like one over square root of t means that h dot behaves like square root of t, so it goes to infinity. Nevertheless, they are not able to conclude uh, in the two-dimensional case. So they prove that global solutions exist, but they said at least for the linearized problem, both solution situations can occur in terms of the initial data. Solutions go to infinity or, uh, or solid stops asymptotically. Uh, so when we began this work, nothing was known for omega uh, for if in R3 or even for R2 for a solid, which is not a disk. Uh, so our result, roughly speaking, uh, says so uh, uh, that uh, so this is a kind of output which I have I have here. H I can see H dot as an output, the velocity of the solid. So I I am interested in the velocity everywhere because I want to prove global existence. But my question, my main question, concerns the behavior of the solid for large time. And what we can show is is that this with under this smallest condition written in red here. So you see, it's, it's a bit strange because I here I ask my initial data to be in W1Q, but also uh, uh, in L3. Uh, so it depends on three, so it should be, uh, by, by the symbolic embedding problem, this, uh, this will be automatically be in L3 depending on Q, but I can also assume it separately. So uh, here I have a decay of H dot, like t power minus three half. So two conclusions, which are important here. Global in time solution exists for small data. And the uh, uh, second conclusion, uh, the output, which is the velocity of a fluid, behaves like t power minus three half, which means when I integrate to get the position of the solid, that I get something like one over square root of two. So it stops, it stops in finite time. Once again, I don't, in infinite time, sorry. Once I, again, I don't know where. It will stabilize somewhere in space. I have no clue in saying in which position in the absence of the input function. Nevertheless, we conjecture that we can find the input to, to stop it wherever we want. So now let me be a bit, a bit technical and explain how uh, 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 is the philosophy behind the, uh, this kind of well posedness. So this philosophy evolved a lot in the last 20 years. It's, I, I, I've said that, uh, in fact, this kind of problems began to be studied from a PD viewpoint, from a modern PD viewpoint, let's say like 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. So this philosophy evolved a lot. So I'll try to, uh, to advertise one of these uh, approaches, which is uh, the one which uh, is somehow uh, quite inspired by, by control theory, uh, because uh, if I look to my equations, uh, so uh, forget one moment about the nonlinear term, I have the Stokes equation, uh, and I can look here, V of the boundary is given by a certain input. I, I could in a, in a certain, in a first stage, consider that this uh, uh, rigid velocity field is an input function. And then uh, this input, in fact, I take it as a feedback. So this is a, can be seen as a feedback system. My velocity 
uh, on the boundary is given by a dynamic feedback before H and omega, which appear in my boundary condition, are uh, the selves obtained by solving uh, a system of ODEs for given V and P. So this is a dynamic feedback problem, and this has been formalized uh, uh, in uh, my some of my works with uh, with Debian Mighty, uh, and where in fact from the regularity properties of the, of the PD part, we can obtain via this uh, closed loop uh, via this boundary feedback, we can obtain uh, similar properties for the whole systems. Uh, so this is the general philosophy. More precisely, what we do here is even for the linear problem, we define function spaces uh, which are uncoupled and an uncoupled operator. This is called the monolithic approach, uh, which um, is obtained in the following way. So here we, a priori, we have two unknowns. It's the velocity of the fluid and the velocity of the solid. It's also the pressure, but we will get rid of it quite quickly. Uh, so the key of what's called the monolithic approach is to extend the velocity of the fluid by the velocity of the solid. Uh, so what I get here is a state space, what will be my state space is XQ, which are functions which are LQ in the whole space. In all space, so I should have said that here omega is equal to R3, LQ in the whole space, divergence equal to zero in the whole space. What I mean divergence is divergence in the distribution sense, which I can compute, of course. And DFE is what's called the, uh, the um, deformation tensor. Uh, uh, which is the symmetric gradient of phi, which is supposed to be zero in the solid. This condition df phi is equal to zero, roughly speaking, says that the velocity field has a form, which is here, rise like this in the solid. So it's the velocity uh, field which corresponds to a rigid motion, so which a natural field. So this space has to be studied, it appeared quite, quite recently, with uh, the study of this type of problems, uh, but it has very good properties. And we can define also a generalization of the Stokes operator, which is the operator having this domain. So now I take functions which are H2 in the fluid, which are two times differentiable in the fluid, uh, in the fluid domain, which have free divergence everywhere and which are rigid in the rigid part. And then our operator will be defined similarly with a Stokes operator uh, as um, an application of a Leray or Helmholtz sign projector uh, to the uh, to something which is the, the generalization of the Laplace operator. So here there are other things in one slide, but what uh, what I sh you should retain retain is just that uh, we uh, ad adopt a monolithic approach. So we extend our vector velocity field everywhere, and then we do something which is similar to the Helmholtz type projector to define uh, the, the analog of the Stokes operator. This operator is called the free structure operator. Uh, so it has been shown in an old paper of uh, Takashi and myself that it's, this is an analytic semigroup in X2. Uh, this can be exploited to get some results, but the interesting theory is really the LQ theory here. And then we have shown that um, uh, it's also analytic, that's more recent, in the space XQ, and that it has the maximal regularity property, which is even stronger than analytic. Uh, so these are much more recent works. Uh, and uh, everything is based on, uh, on the resolvent system. I will maybe not uh, give uh, all, all the details. Uh, so here the notation, however, I need to introduce some notation. And then, uh, in fact, what we did is roughly speaking some algebra from Ivashita's result, some resolvent algebra. So from Ivashita's results, with some work, 
One is able to prove that if I consider this problem, which if I look here, it's a stationary stocks system. So there is no time here, but it's a frequency term, lambda w. Uh, so this is a resolved equation in a non-homogeneous resolved equation corresponding to stokes in the fixed domain. Then uh, from Ivashita's results, we are able to show that uh, the solution, this problem has a solution w eta uh, the, for every uh, L and omega fixed. L and omega here are three-dimensional vectors, nothing more. Uh, and uh, then we are able to show that this solution operated by lambda in the resolvent, which associates to, to two vectors, L and omega, the solution, this space is here for uh, W, this one is for eta, and there are weighted subordinate so spaces, I will not uh, insist so much. Uh, in these weighted subordinate so spaces, these operators, the solution operated in lambda, does not blow up when lambda goes to zero inside inside this this sector. If you are accustomed with uh, analytic semigroup and with sectorial operators, this kind of sector uh, uh, appears in a very natural uh, manner. Uh, so, what's crucial here? This is just Ivashita adapted. Uh, is uh, that uh, these operators, in a certain sense, do not blow up when lambda goes to zero. Although lambda is equal to zero, is, in the res is not in the resolvent set of our Stokes operator. And then, in fact, we did the same thing for the resolvent equation, this time for the fluid structure operator. Here is the resolvent system from the fixed here, L and omega are no longer given. They are solutions, part of the solution of this boundary value problem. And then here we have shown just doing some more or less algebraic manipulations that we have similar estimates for the solutions operators, which are R of lambda and P of lambda. So R of lambda is for the velocity U and uh, uh, P of lambda is for the pressure. So again, lack of blow up, but in these very particular norms, which are weighted norms, roughly speaking, we don't control what happens far away in these norms. There are some kind of local estimates and we can show that these operators do not blow up. So this is um, the essential step in first proving that our semigroup is analytic and then uh, using the fact that the semigroup is the uh, inverse Laplace transform of the resolvent, we obtain decay estimates for the semigroup. If we look to them, are very similar to those which are known for the heating. So here there is a big work to, to, get, uh, to get this, uh, to this transformation. And especially what's very difficult, it's the estimates on the gradient, which if we look here are even better uh, uh, as the estimates on the functions, but uh, which are essential uh, to do the fixed point uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and then uh, how we solve the nonlinear problem. So this can be used, as I showed you for the, uh, for the heat equations and also the Stokes heat system exactly to get ISS estimate, ISS type estimate or more uh, um, input to input output estimates uh, for the linearized free structure problem. That's just the same as for the Stokes problem. If I want to go to the nonlinear problem, I have to do a fixed point. And in fact, we do more more sophisticated, a bit more sophisticated, we go back to the procedure of Cato, which Cato introduced for Navier-Stokes. Uh, so we use this procedure because at that time we didn't have the maximum regularity property. Now the procedure can be a bit simplified. Uh, and then the procedure, as I mentioned, is to do a fixed point directly in weighted spaces. So what I do is I take a, a, a sequence of uh, functions here, I should put here, I, I, it's lacking here, it's a Vn plus one of t, sorry. Here it's lacking here, it's Vn plus one, is equal to the solution of the homogeneous problem plus this term with Vn. So I get a Picard type iterations. What's in, important that I, I'm working in these spaces, which are very strange. They are the result of a lot of tries, 
and they are a lot inspired by Cato's approach to Navier-Stokes, and we are able to prove that this iterative procedure converges in, in the norm of this uh, space is C, and that the solution is a unique solution of the nonlinear problem, and all this provided that the initial data are small enough. So once again, here, it is not a uh, Lyapunov type approach, and I think I think it would be very difficult to get one. There is no, uh, let's say, Lyapunov type approach already for proving the, the global existence. Uh, so if I want to add an input, which we did not do yet, it's an open problem. Uh, I don't think it would be the right way to do it, the easiest way to do it. So the easiest and the most natural one is from the beginning to take functions in defined on zero infinity and to do fixed point in, in these spaces, provided that this V0 uh, is small. Uh, so that's uh, what I wanted to say. As I wanted to, uh, let's say, give as examples, uh, is that in complicated problems coming from fluid dynamics, for even for fixed, but also uh, with moving uh, geomet geometry, sometimes uh, working with um, local solutions and then extending that to global ones by the Apunov type approaches, at least is not known to work. Uh, and a possible alternative uh, would be to do directly a fixed point in, in, in weighted spaces, uh, which takes in consideration the decay rate of the linear problem. And the fact that in fact, there is not uh, these problems may not, may be not exponentially stable. So to conclude, Uh, it's uh, to me uh, an open question which would be the right type of uh, uh, estimates for um, ISS estimates for fluid structure problems in free in free D. Even in bounded domains, I think that here the problem is easier, but it still has to be uh, uh, tackled uh, in detail. And uh, for unbounded domains, uh, I think that the concept should be a little adapted. Uh, then uh, to uh, discuss problems with multiple um, equilibria. So uh, uh, if I go to the, the problem where I said that um, when t goes to infinity, I can stabilize anywhere, uh, then maybe you can distinguish between the stability of these various equilibrium positions. Uh, uh, it's a famous problem called, called the adiabatic piston problem, which I didn't formulate it, where this question is really uh, relevant. And then something we begin to work, we have some preliminary results on that, is the case when the, the fracture, the structure is not inside the fluid, but I have a, a waves, I have water waves, and I have a floating structure on it. Here there are some preliminary works, but uh, as far as I know, nothing uh, is known on, um, on ISS and even global existence requires uh, some, um, uh, some work to, be, uh, to include uh, interesting practical examples. Uh, so I think I will uh, end here, and I thank you very much for, uh, for your attention.